everybody, and welcome to Lesson 3.4, Human Population Impacts. The content in this video is aligned to the third edition of Environmental Science for AP, and while it does not apply to any particular AP CED unit, it does cover material useful for free response questions. In our last lesson, we discovered the variety of factors that interact to develop human populations in the size and locations that we know today. In this lesson, we turn our focus to the impacts that these populations have on the world around them. Here are our content objectives for this lesson. Human activities, including the use of resources, have physical, chemical, and biological consequences for ecosystems. The health of a species is closely tied to its ecosystem, and minor environmental changes can have a large impact. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to Explain how the IPAD equation measures human population impact. Explain the relationship between affluence and environmental safety. Explain the global and local impacts of human population. Identify and explain the ways in which human populations modify their ecosystems. Explain how human activities in one place affect populations in another. And explain the relationship between population growth, conflict, and poverty. This leads us to attempting to answer our guiding question. How do humans impact their world? This is the IPAD equation, which was developed by Barry Commoner, John Holdren, and Paul Erick, who was the author of The Population Bomb, in order to estimate the impact of various human lifestyles on Earth. The equation looks at three major factors of resource use and consequences in order to understand the impact of a particular country or population. Impact is measured in terms of emissions, often in tons of CO2. It can also be converted into an ecological footprint, but that is beyond the scope of our study of the IPAD equation. Impact is a function of the multiplication of population size, the number of people in the population being explored, affluence, which is identified as consumption per each person in the population, and technology, the emission produced by each consumption. As we know, population has a direct and clear impact on emissions. We can reliably say that as population goes up, so do emissions. Affluence, however, is a different story. The connection is not as straightforward as population size. Affluence is related to economic opportunity and is often higher in developed countries and lower in developing countries. Technology, or as many scientists now refer to it, destructive technology, is an even more complicated relationship. An appropriate iPad equation looks at the impact of technology that degrades the ecosystems, such as production of CFCs or coal burning factories, rather than those that are beneficial, such as electric cars that are charged on renewable energy. By looking at the formula closely, you can see that it is a basic dimensional analysis problem where units can be crossed out in order to provide us with the final answer in emissions. It is also a plug and play formula in that if you know three of the factors, you can calculate the fourth using rules of algebra. Take a moment and look at the per capita ecological footprints indicated in the lower left hand corner of your screen. Let's take a closer look at affluence. Remember that IPAT usually deals with per capita impact, which is a measure of impact per person in a population. Affluence is typically explored using the idea of gross domestic product, which is measured as the total value of all products and services produced within the borders of a country in a single year. GDP is made up of consumer spending, investment, government spending, and exports minus imports. As we saw with the DTM, as populations grow, their technology shifts from subsistence through industrialization to a post-industrial society. We can use the GDP to help place a country within a DTM stage, as well as to make predictions as to how highly environmental protection is prioritized. Here you see what is known as Kuznets curve. The curve is designed to explore the relationship between GDP and environmental degradation. The parabolic shape indicates that there is a turning point somewhere in the development of a country's economy where environmental protection moves from low priority to a higher priority. This may happen purposefully through government policy or expectations, or it can happen through the shift from fossil fuel-based industry 
to renewable energy and technology-based societies. Some argue that encouraging high GDP and economic development is a good thing for population control. After all, we know that populations in the post-industrial and declining stages have smaller populations and therefore are more likely to use fewer resources. Let's take a moment and explore the global and local impacts of human population growth. Global impacts typically come from affluent societies or MDCs. This is where fewer local resources are consumed and global trade and travel have large ecological footprints. Air, water, and soil pollution through resource use and transportation are the common impacts and impact not only the individuals in an area, but the entire population of the earth in total. Another global impact is urbanization. We know that 50% of the global population is urban, but in affluent areas in developed countries, 75% of the population is urban based. Now let's look at the local impacts. These are more common in developing countries where local resources are used more often. This is often related to deforestation, soil degradation, and resource uses such as commons. And it may be beneficial to the local economy, but it's harmful for the whole population as the tragedy of the commons tends to play a role. Let's move on to look more specifically at the ways in which human populations impact their world. We'll be looking at this primarily in regard to how other human populations are affected, but we will take a brief glance at the impact on ecosystems and earth systems here. Those impacts will be further explored in future units and lessons. In terms of ecosystems, humans are detrimental to the existence and health of habitats. This lack of functional habitat can lead to biodiversity loss, which is measured by the decrease in number, type, or genetic diversity of organisms, as well as the potential extinction of those organisms. Humans also impact these ecosystems by the introduction of invasive species, or species that are non-endemic to an area, but who are able to outcompete the endemic species. When it comes to earth systems, the focus is largely on resource use. Human demand for agricultural and animal products leads to reduced soil quality and freshwater availability. Mining disrupts landscapes that could be used for other purposes, gives access to fossil fuels and uranium that can be burned or used to produce electricity or transportation methods, and contributes heavily to aquatic and atmospheric pollution. Manufacturing of materials, as well as the production of chemicals that persist in the ecosystem, such as CFCs, have prolonged and extensive impacts long after the population is gone. Let's start our discussion of human population impacts on other human populations by looking at one of the simplest and most timely topics, diseases. As we all know, disease is based on what we know as germ theory meaning that some sort of germ, such as a virus, bacterium, amoeba, or parasite, transfers a disease from one host to another. There are multiple routes of transmission, including breathing in droplets of germs, touching contaminated items and then touching the mucous membranes, sexual transmission, and blood or bodily fluid-borne. One of the things we do know is that diseases spread much more quickly in dense areas. What this means is when members of a population are in consistent, constant, and close proximity to one another, it is easier for a germ to pass from one host to another in the preferred route of transmission. This density can be even more helpful with germs that have a high reproduction number or number of people an infected individual can infect. The higher the reproduction number, the more contagious the disease. For example, the seasonal flu has an R sub zero of 1.2. The last global pandemic, the Spanish influenza of 1918, had an R sub zero of anywhere from 2 to 20, depending on the population density. COVID-19 has an R sub zero of anywhere from 1 to 7 for the exact same reason. It is for this reason that herd immunity is an important method of reducing the impact of human populations on one another when it comes to disease transmission. Herd immunity is the way in which we describe how either natural or vaccination-stimulated immunity reduces the transmission of a disease, regardless of density, by reducing the number of susceptible or immunocompromised individuals. 
In this way, the spread of a germ is slowed as it takes longer for it to get to new hosts. Vaccination, combined with common sense practices such as frequent hand washing, remaining at home if you're sick, or wearing a cloth face covering if you must go out, can work extensively to reduce the spread of a disease between human populations, regardless of how dense they are. Beyond disease, one of the biggest impacts that human populations have on each other is resource selfishness, or resource hoarding. This often leads to conflict between groups, particularly those who are already in desperate need of resources. Conflict over resources occurs in a variety of instances, although it is more common in developing countries than developed ones. This conflict is fueled by food insecurity, brought on by drought, sea level rise, soil degradation, and land scarcity. Other environmental factors like increased storm strength and frequency, bringing with it heavy rain and flood, as well as heat waves play a part as well. One thing to note is that these things can be immediately traced back to climate change. This is a key problem that we can address in order to mitigate the effect of future climate refugees. The term climate refugee is telling. People who are pushed away from their homes because of resource loss and conflict over scarce resources are the same as those who are fleeing an authoritarian regime. It is vital that we address climate change from a perspective of equity and justice in order to meet the unique needs of the people who are being impacted. Unfortunately, climate change isn't the only factor that contributes to this kind of conflict. Capitalism, resource privatization, and the resulting poverty are other key factors that drive conflict. Companies like Nestle and Coca-Cola have recently made massive pushes to privatize water resources in a variety of areas. For example, during the 2016 drought in California, Nestle extensively depleted an aquifer on an indigenous reservation to produce its bottled water brand Arrowhead, then sold it back to citizens in supermarkets for a profit. The push to privatize resources like fresh water further drives this conflict toward brutal and avoidable ends. Realize that this conflict is created by these scarce resources and this conflict continues to be a problem. It is a negative feedback loop that exacerbates the problem as conflict as the conflict itself becomes more widespread and vigorous. This map demonstrates areas where water conflict has happened from 1990 to 2008. This can be used to help predict future instances of violence. This map uses a combination of color coding and concentric circles to identify areas of violence. The darker the color, the more conflict events that occurred during the measured time period. The addition of the concentric rings denotes hostile conflicts during that same time period. The more concentric rings, the more hostile events took place. Notice that the majority of them are in Southeast Asia and the Levant area of the Middle East. These hotspots of potential conflict also coincide with areas that are particularly dry in general or areas with limited fresh water due to sea level rise and saltwater intrusion. Climate change will continue to make these problems worse, leading to outbreaks of further bloody conflict over access and rights to the water that is found in these areas. This will further exacerbate the problems that we've already discussed, drought, food insecurity, that creates an almost inescapable negative feedback loop begun and perpetuated by human beings. Additionally, Note that areas of water conflict often coincide with areas of cultural or religious conflict as well. Disease and resource conflict often lead directly to poverty. The drive for capitalism pushes jobs with low wages and no benefits, often in areas that increase the chances that an individual will be exposed to carcinogenic or other toxic substances. The graph shows us that the number of individuals in extreme poverty are extreme. These values are identified using the per capita consumption of $1.90 a day. The fact that globally there are 1.8 billion people living in extreme poverty can be strongly correlated to conflict over resources, capitalistic drives to privatize resources, and overpopulation. And of course, poverty often cycles back making people more likely to catch diseases that are communicable, be unable to visit a doctor because of a lack of insurance, a loss of income due to staying home when ill, 
or transmitting the disease to others when they have to go to work to keep a roof over the family's head. Food insecurity comes far, not far behind and depending on where you are, conflict is sure to follow. Let's not leave this discussion on a point of doom and gloom. There is hope for reigning in the problems associated with human population growth. The United Nations has put together 17 goals that aim to reduce the resource use and population sizes while increasing the quality of life for the almost 8 billion people on the planet. There is a goal for everything we talked about today. The problems that human population causes can be fixed but only if the entire population of the planet focuses on the common good, eliminating poverty, especially childhood poverty, eliminating food insecurity, providing health care and education, closing the gap between male and female opportunities and treatment, providing clean water and properly sanitized living spaces, clean energy and a drive toward appropriate economic growth, increases in infrastructure, reducing inequalities, the development of sustainable cities, responsible consumption, climate action, the protection of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, and global peace and equal justice. It is not until every single one of us take a stand to strive for these goals that we will get anywhere close. But it's not enough to take individual action. We must hold corporations and governments accountable for their production of almost 80% of global waste and greenhouse gases for their constant drive to privatize and to place profit over people. The following slide provides you with an opportunity to see how some of these ideas are connected. Feel free to pause the video and explore the connections between these topics. Then use the statements at the beginning to review.